28, 2016 school committee meeting. We're happy to have you join us. This meeting is being recorded by East Hampton Media. East Hampton Media channels 191, 192, and 193 is looking for volunteers. If anyone is interested in helping to tape city government meetings, please contact Kathy Lynch at 413-203-1360. And we'd like to thank Tim Riley for taping tonight's meeting for us. Superintendent, Superintendent Follinsby, do you have some announcements for us? I have one sad announcement here tonight. Now that school's out, we don't have <laughs> lots of wonderful things to announce. But the announcement is that the next uh, regular school committee meetings are July 26th and August 9th, 2016. Thank you very much. Do we have some correspondence? I believe we do. Oh, okay. Hang on. I am. It is right here. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. That's gifts. That's gifts. Okay, we, that's gifts. We do not have correspondence. We do not have correspondence. So we'll move on to gifts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Um, so I would, uh, would ask that we uh, accept with thanks a gift in the amount of $400 from the Healthy Youth Coalition. Um, two. 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 Sorry. Two. <laughs> okay. I was waiting to hear the end of that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How's that sound? From Albie it's Park. Right. Um, from from um, from Albie Park, of 101 Lovefield Street in East Hampton. I'll make the motion. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Motion passes. Thank you very much. We appreciate that gift very much. You need this too. Okay. Okay, uh, next on our agenda is our public speak portion of our meeting where we invite anyone who would like to, uh, from the public, come and speak to us about any topic. You're invited to do so at this time. It doesn't look as though anyone wants to do that. So we'll move right on to our first presentation and that is um, by our student, Alice Wanamaker, and she's coming to speak to us about the Whitebrook Middle School dress code. Could you turn a few lights off, please? everyone, my name is Alice Wanamaker. I will be going into 8th grade at Whitebrook Middle School this fall. And I'm here to propose that the Whitebrook dress code be updated. I first became interested in this topic when I was doing research for an article for the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. It was called Fashion Statement and it studied dress codes all across East Hampton, the public schools, Williston, and the Hilltown Charter School. While I was researching, I noticed that regulations in the Whitebrook dress code didn't always align with Whitebrook values, and I saw that as evidence that updates were required. To provide evidence for this proposal, I did a needs assessment of the school. I surveyed one classroom from each grade, which is a representative sample of the school population. Half the school took the survey on paper, and the other half took it online. Uh, the data I collected about respondents was their grade, because I was wondering did students of different grades feel differently about the dress code, and their gender, because I wondered if different gendered students had different experiences with the dress code. That might raise a question of equality. From researching my article, I gained in-depth knowledge of the Whitebrook dress code, as well as information about the staff's opinion of the dress code, and I also used my position as a Whitebrook student as information for this proposal. One question I asked was, what gender is most affected by the dress code? 82.5% of students believed that females were somewhat or much more affected by the dress code. This graph shows how students of different genders responded to the question of what gender is most affected by the dress code. For all groups, the most popular answer by far was the green, females are more affected. The percentage of individual groups that gave that answer ranged from 70 to 93 percent, always a significant majority. Only male students thought that males were more affected by the dress code, and they amounted to under 4 percent of total responses. I asked respondents about their opinion of the dress code. This graph shows the results of that question distributed by gender. 
54% of girls felt that some or most trends were not allowed in school. Only 23% of boys felt the same way. 47% of boys thought that some or most trends were allowed. Only 36% of girls agreed. My data showed that girls consistently had a more negative perspective of the dress code than boys. Here I show students' opinions of the dress code distributed by grade. First, let's look at the green bar. From 5th to 6th grade, the percentage of students who thought more trends were allowed shrunk from 52 to 25 percent. And with the red bar, the percentage of students who thought more trends were not allowed rose from 24 to 50 percent from 5th to 6th grade and stayed consistently high throughout 7th and 8th grade. After one year under the dress code, students' opinions of the dress code became much more negative. I asked students how often they knowingly break the dress code, and here are the responses distributed by grade. The percentage of students who sometimes or often break the dress code rises with every grade level, from 0% in 5th grade up to 20% in 6th grade to 24% in 7th grade and all the way up to 36% in 8th grade. Here's another way of looking at the same data. This graph shows the steady increase in the percent of students who regularly break the dress code in each grade. This graph shows responses to my question about breaking the dress code, but this time distributed by gender. 45% of students never knowingly break the dress code. However, this includes 67% of boys, but only 29% of girls. I asked all students who regularly broke the dress code, who, uh, to clarify who gave the answer, I sometimes or often break the dress code, how often they were approached by a teacher for breaking the dress code. There are some limitations to this data, mainly that there were very few non-female students who regularly broke the dress code. However, I did notice something discomforting, which was that only female students reported being approached almost every time they broke the dress code. Here I show all the responses from all students who gave an answer other than, I never break the dress code. Out of all students who sometimes or often break the dress code, 75% were rarely or never approached by a teacher for it. You may have noticed that when I started this presentation, I was wearing a very conspicuous hat. The current dress code does not allow hats in school. I wore that hat for an entire school day, including gym class, and I was not dress coded for it. I'd now like to transition to some information I got about the dress code that's not in the form of charts and graphs. These... I apologize for interrupting, yeah. but can I ask one clarifying question just so that I can follow what you're saying? When you use the term trends, can you just tell me a little bit more? I think I know what that means. Um, so clothing that is currently fashionable. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so the five items up here are currently banned in school. They apply mainly to female students. Although anyone is able to wear these items, they're not part of typically male fashion. There are no guidelines that do not apply to socially acceptable female fashion. These are some quotes from Weibrick faculty about the dress code, which I heard in interviews for my Scholastic article. I'm not okay with using thinking and language in the classroom <coughs> that I don't believe in. I don't get involved with it. That's from a teacher at Weibrick Middle School. If a dress code is too strict, it takes away people's sense of identities. That's from the principal at Weibrick. Obviously, I don't have enough data to make generalizations about all faculty's opinions of the dress code. However, these quotes do show that not all staff members are supportive of the current dress code, which amplifies my finding that the dress code is not currently enforced. As an open response question on my survey, I asked students how they would dress if they did not have to follow the dress code. Here are a few of the responses I received. I would be able to wear things I want to wear instead of having to wear clothes that I don't like wearing. I would wear everything in my closet instead of having to search for something to wear. I would be able to wear certain clothes that I usually wear outside of school. These quotes show that students often wear clothing that is against the dress code while they are outside of school, and that the dress code makes it more difficult for them to find an outfit they like in the morning. And here are the conclusions I drew from my survey. Most students believe that females are more impacted by the dress code than males. It's problematic that we have a set of rules that affect some students more than others. It sets a precedent to students that, is, that it is okay to restrict girls more than boys. Females have a consistently more negative perspective of the dress code than males. 
This is another piece of proof that the dress code impacts female students more strongly. If all students were equally, were equally affected by the dress code, there wouldn't be a gender divide in opinions of the dress code. The percentage of students who regularly break the dress code increases with every grade. As students spend more time with the dress code, they like it less and less. Perhaps, as students develop personal style, they're unable to find clothing that fits the dress code and expresses the statement they're aiming for. But regardless, an updated dress code could decrease students' need to break it in order to express themselves. Female students are approached more often than male students for breaking the dress code. Is this because female students' instances of rebellion are easier to spot? Because it is seen as more inappropriate or sexual when female students break the dress code? Regardless, it's problematic that female students are approached more often when they break the same rules. Students are rarely approached by staff when they break the dress code. This could be attributed to two possibilities. One, staff are not aware of rules being broken. Either they don't notice forbidden clothing or they don't know that certain clothing is forbidden. Or two, staff do not support the dress code and choose not to approach students about infringement. Having rules that are not consistently enforced sets a precedent that rules don't have to be followed. If the dress code was updated, staff would have to look at it to learn the new rules. They would be more aware of rules and more able to notice rules being broken. Staff also might have more positive opinions of an updated dress code, and they would put in more effort to enforce a rule if they strongly agreed with it. So my recommendations are that the dress code should be updated with the following goals in mind using more current and relevant language, with regulations that affect current fashion, and in order to affect all students equally, regardless of gender. And updating the dress code with these goals in mind will accomplish the following. Students and staff will have a more positive perception of the dress code. The dress code will be more regularly enforced. The percentage of students who break the dress code regularly will decrease. And students of all genders will have similar perceptions and experiences of the dress code. So my findings call for an update of the dress code, which I'm hoping can be accomplished for the next school year. And my question to you are, what are the next steps to take? Uh, in my survey, I collected data that supports a dress, code, a dress code update, but I didn't collect data to inform specific change proposals. Uh, I want to let you know that I would be more than happy to take on that task, if you would like me to. Uh, but either way, thank you so much for letting me speak tonight. Thank you, Alice. Thank you very much. Will you pass out the some thing? questions? Mm -hmm. no. I have the things. I have the things. Alice, do you want to stay put for a minute and we'll just see if anyone has any questions? So yeah, stay sure. near the microphone. Pass it off for you. Okay. So, 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 the lights so I have a summary of the findings of my survey. I have a copy of my survey and I have a copy of this Scholastic Art and Writing Award article. Cool. Well, you've certainly done a very impressive job researching this topic. Thank you. Um, and we're very grateful that you've come to speak with us. Thanks. Yeah, I, I don't have a question as much as an acknowledgement for you because um, you're very well informed and the presentation was excellent and you're very passionate about it. So thank you for bringing it to the committee. And um, yeah, you're a very poised young lady. Um, um, yeah, I acknowledge you for, for your presentation. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, Alice, um, I think you said early on in your presentation that your interest in doing this survey came from um, something else you had done previously. And what was that that you had done previously? Was that with the, uh, could you tell us a little more about that? Um, yeah, so I entered the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Uh, I wrote an article in the journalism category called Fashion Statement, uh, which was about dress codes and some common problems with them and how those could possibly be addressed. It was a little bit more general, like it was speaking to dress codes all across the country, uh, but I looked specifically at all the dress codes in East Hampton. Mm -hmm. And that was the, uh, the, the, the germ of, of this idea that you had to do something here in East Hampton. Yeah, I noticed specifically, um, well, I noticed some problems in all of them, mm -hmm. but that was the one that affected me most, so that was the one that I had the most motivation to do something about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alice, for taking the time to do this. Thank you. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. Very well presented, Alice. Um, a lot of time and effort had to go into this. And, and very good research. Yeah. I like the fact that you included all this data.
I think at this point what we would suggest is, um, I'm sure you maybe have already presented this to your principal and vice principal yes, at uh, the school. Yes, I presented to the school committee before having here and I got a unanimous vote of approval to bring it on to this committee. School council. School, school council. council. Right. I cool. So, so what's the procedure? Yeah, what do we need to do? Direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would think that it would be, um, the next step would be for Perhaps you could lead the effort with your principal and vice principal to come up with a revised draft code. What you propose? Yeah, um, I haven't st I haven't started collecting data for that, but I have been working on like thinking of ways that I could collect data for that mm -hmm. type of proposal. So maybe you could work with your um, leadership at the school uh -huh. and the school council, and come up with a recommendation, and then you could bring that recommendation to us ultimately for us to approve it. We would have to go to policy, right? So. Well, we'll actually, it would policy. have to go to the school first. No, after after, the after that, right. when it comes back to the school committee, uh, would it, would it have to go to policy? Typically, have that. Not for student handbooks. Yeah, yeah no. But handbook yeah. changes, we we can take we care can of um, mm -hmm. in the committee of the whole. Right. Correct. Right. right. Um, it might be mm -hmm. if it's if you're finding that it's um, at all. I I say this, Alice, having just we just had a lengthy conversation last month at Williston about the dress code. And, it, and every three or four years, mm -hmm. it's a topic. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how frequently um, it, it comes up in, in um, you know, it has in your experience here. And there's a lot that you've identified that comes up persistently. I, I will tell you, it, it is so resonant with me that on Friday morning, when I was watching the news um, from um, the vote in Great Britain on the EU, and I was watching one of the uh, reporters who was on the floor of the stock exchange in New York, and I noted that she was, in a, you know, in a moment she knew she was going to be on national television, was out of the Willison dress code. That the way she was dressed in that moment would have um, earned her, uh, um, you know, some kind of intervention for being dressed inappropriately in a, in a way that you've already identified as one of the ways here. So the complexity of this is um, is clear when when the messages that. Uh, particularly uh, young women see from a professional role model who's dressed in a way that would contradict Whitebrook's and Williston's dress code, um, I think it only testifies to the difficulty of this. I, I'm not sure whether it's necessarily a statement about whether that's right or wrong, but it was instantly clear. I picked up the phone and called the dean of students and said, here's part of the challenge for students is that what they see in a professional context, were they to dress that way in school, <laughs> Um, and how do we negotiate that? Does that mean that professional standards are, are complicated, which was, <laughs> to be frank, part of my first thought, um, but also looking at it from the perspective of students, how, how do we mediate between what the broader cultural world is telling you and what the specific rules are? Well, yeah. I like what you, with your survey, the first thing I noticed, first of all, is how detailed it is. Um. But you have a list of, you know, your third question. Um, these are currently banned, which should be allowed. So being very specific like that is it obviously is very useful and helpful. So, um, and I, I am in just interested in the process. And as I think, you know, I remember, and it seemed like last year with the high school, there was a lot of discussion about the dress code. So it, it, it's, you know. So I think as, as Peter mentioned, you know, the process mm -hmm. would occur at the building level. Uh, Alice could continue working with her principal and assistant principal to try to develop some new guidelines. Mm -hmm. And then once those guidelines are determined at the building level, then they would mm -hmm. come here to the school committee for final approval mm -hmm. as part of the handbook, as you mentioned. Uh, That's great. Here. That's mm -hmm. great. And, and if I can, just since it will come here in the end, and I don't want to surprise you then, I think that one of the things that's important for me individually as a teacher and as a school committee member is that whatever dress code is established in a school is that it's it's related to the purpose of the of your being in school that is i operate from an assumption that i would just share with you up front that that um a student would be likely to and i think it was perfectly appropriately to um, dress differently to go to the movies with friends on a saturday afternoon than they would for um, eighth grade English class and that the way we dress should convey something and I apologize of course for dashing in tonight with my shoes untied so I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a hypocrite at, the, at this moment but that we we normally convey something about the way we're dressed as an understanding 
of, of where we are and what we're doing. Um, and, and that that is sort of a, a fundamental touchstone, if you will, that if, we, if, if that can be part of the logic of the changes you suggest, uh, I know that from my perspective they'd be better received. I, I just think it is important um, that, that students, when they're dressing for school, convey that they understand that there's, there's a different purpose there than there might be in a social or an athletic um, or on a family outing. You know, if you're hiking hot time, you're going to dress differently uh, than, than you would. And I think that that's um, an important piece to keep in mind as you, uh, along with the, the key pieces that you've identified. And, and I do think one of the points that you make here that's crucial is anytime you have a, a, a rule that is either widely ignored or widely misunderstood, you lay a seed for the question of, well, what else does the school says it does that it doesn't do? And that, that can be deadly, right? So we want to be congruent. You know, we want to be who we are, is what we say, is what we do. And Alice, you also spent a lot of time talking about enforcement, how it's enforced differently or not enforced at all. So I think exactly what we were talking about, what you've done with, you know, um, if, if it's very easy to follow, everybody knows what, what it is, what's approved and what's not, and then that leads to enforcement, so to speak, of what doesn't comply. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that updates... No confusion. Yeah, updates would increase, like, the ability of staff to enforce the dress code, mm -hmm. as well as the, like, motivation that mm -hmm. staff have to And easy to be aware of what's, you know, what needs to be enforced. Exactly. I also um, just want to say, and I'm sorry that I came in late, I apologize. Um, I also really appreciate the way, and I just read your report um, here, I really appreciate the way that you addressed uh, the gender of the students involved um, in a very like inclusive um, kind of all genders versus talking about boys and girls or men and women um, because there are non-binary students in the school, as you know, yeah. and I'm really glad to see that their needs are being addressed here as well. So I really appreciate that, and thank you for doing that. Yeah, I was hoping to include more data on non-binary non students, I did include that as mm -hmm. an option in my survey. Um, however, there turned out to be very few <laughs> students who checked that in the specific classrooms yeah. that I surveyed. So, with my limited sample, I didn't have enough. N I didn't have enough people. And I really like appreciate the integrity of your research methods mm -hmm. too, because I think a lot of people, yeah. if one person clicked that, they'd say like, okay, well, all the non-binary students want this, you know, and then yeah. you'd be like, oh, it's 100% of the survey respondents. So I appreciate that as well. I think we're all very impressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is good. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well done. Yeah, the gender neutrality piece is, it's true. Yeah. This is, this is, this is an impressive, um, movement of, of the conversation forward so thank you mm -hmm. yes thank you so much thank you Alice. thank you, thank you Alice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I also want to thank principal Belize and assistant principal Pasquini for their support of Alice and this initiative and uh, for taking uh, Alice's research uh, to heart and to uh, move forward with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nancy. I definitely wanted to say that too because I think sometimes, um, many times, students go unheard or feel that they're going unheard. So to have you here for the presentation and also part, you know, being supportive, I think is extremely important. Thank you. We look forward to hearing back. Yeah. When you're finished with all your work. Thank you. Thank and you, you very can, much. And you're under no obligation to spend the remainder of what's a perfectly lovely night here. <laughs> you can watch this on TV later. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the subcommittee reports. Um, I don't believe we have a finance subcommittee report at this time. And policy reviews subcommittee. Sarah. Um, so we met, uh, well, we met briefly on June 20th, oh. and oh. Um, we decided that uh, the superintendent was unable to attend that meeting, and we decided that due to the nature of the things we were discussing, we'd like some more historical perspective. So we're going to um, take it up again um, when we schedule our next meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. And our collaborative for Collaborative for Educational Services representative is not with us tonight, so we will be uh, skipping an update in that area. And we're going to move on now to the superintendent's evaluation overview, which I will share with you. Um, once a year, uh, we 
do a formal summative evaluation of our superintendent uh, performance for the year, and the school, school committee has evaluated Superintendent Follinsby's job performance for the 2015-2016 school year. Each member of the committee has provided a written summative evaluation report after studying and evaluating endless numbers of documents and data <laughs> related to the four key standards of performance for the job of superintendent. The evaluation report created by the state of Massachusetts focuses on the following four areas of performance. Instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. The superintendent is rated as either unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, or exemplary. The state makes it clear that a rating of proficient is considered fully satisfactory. That is the rigorous expected level of performance. I have reviewed each committee member's report and all of their comments and analysis for each standard. The combined results of our committee were very clear. Superintendent Follinsby was rated proficient or exemplary overall on all four of the performance standards. The superintendent has received an exceedingly positive evaluation. This evaluation is available for the public to review. If anyone would like to look at the report, simply ask Sue Colby, executive assistant to the superintendent, for a copy. It'll be clear to anyone who reads the detailed report that we are very fortunate to have Nancy Follinsby as our superintendent. We thank her for outstand her outstanding service to our district. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank school committee members for their feedback, which I very much value. I, I was reading over the reports today, and uh, it, it's very helpful for me to get your feedback. And I also just want to express my thanks to a school committee who supports the work that we're all doing here in East Hampton in the, in the strong way that you support it. So thank you to you as well. Thank you very much. Okay, next we're going to hear from Nancy with an update on a hiring campaign. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so this is <laughs> <laughs> under <Yeah>. other. <laughs> um, I just wanted to give uh, the community and the school committee a, a short update on the process we're involved in uh, in hiring a new director of curriculum for the district. Uh, Dale Doran, our director of business services, uh, I, I've asked her to facilitate this process and she's accepted and it's well underway. We had, I believe, approximately 11 applicants uh, and she narrowed the uh, field down to four that uh, she and uh, believed that, you know, the committee would want to, um, to interview. So the interviews are going to be um, the, I think it's the second to the last week in July. And um, the interview committee is uh, composed of Kelly Brown, a high school teacher. I'm hoping I can remember everybody now. Uh, Marsha Messer um, from the middle school, I believe. And I believe it's Marsha Messer. I should not have started with names. Uh, I know it's Kim Gilbert from the elementary schools. Uh, Judy Averill as our principal. And, um, and uh, Dale Dorn, our director of business services. And Sue, did I get the names correct? No. Oh, you don't know either. I, I believe that's, uh, uh, Dale and I were talking about that this afternoon, and I believe those are the, the members. But if I've got the wrong members, please accept my apologies, and I'll correct that at the next meeting. But, uh, oh, and Pat Therese, uh, a paraprofessional in the district. So um, what I wanted to express is that it's a, a well-rounded interview committee. There's a uh, teacher at each level and uh, the um, union representative for the paraprofessionals, a building administrator and uh, director of business services. So um, we've got some excellent candidates we'll be interviewing and um, we're all going to look forward to uh, the re results of these interviews. Typically the committee will send me um, a, a few finalists or if the committee is unanimous with uh, their opinion about one person in particular they'll send that person forward to me uh, to interview and uh, to make a final decision so um, process is moving along very nicely and, and we're excited about the outcome thank you very much thank you. okay so we'll move on to your report yes actually can I ask May I ask a question regarding sure. the, the committee? I'm, I'm looking at the, and thinking about the role, and we had some conversation about this when we were talking about the, um, your evaluation and, um, and um, thinking we were an executive committee and we haven't settled all those matters, so I don't know. 
how much I can say about this, but I guess I could say this. Given the importance of the position of curriculum uh, director, was there any thought given to expanding the, the committee to include um, parents? Well, and, and I assume that it's, it's been, I don't remember what the committee was, um, the format of the committee um, that was responsible for bringing Polly Parker forward to you. Um, so I, I apologize that I didn't do the research to see whether mm -hmm. my suggestion is, is radical or if this is, is consistent with what you did before. Typically for a central office position, um, well, and particularly for the director of curriculum. Excuse me. God bless you. Uh, we, we haven't included parents, not that we couldn't, but parents aren't generally impacted directly by the director of curriculum. The director of curriculum works primarily with our teachers and our administrators, and it's also a, a grants management position, uh, and with uh, central office personnel in terms of establishing um, professional development, in terms of making sure that our curriculum is aligned with state standards, uh, in writing our uh, grants and in managing those grants. So most of the director of curriculum's job functions don't relate directly with parents. I mean, I think parents, parent involvement and in everything is always welcome, but uh, typically we haven't included that in the uh, uh, interview committee for the director of curriculum, I believe for those reasons, but it's not that it's not something that could uh, could be considered in the future. Well, yes. Oops. I'm sorry. Just from my perspective, I, I think that um, we have one of the non-financial but enormous resources that we have in this valley are um, incredibly talented and involved and well-informed parents, um, some of whom might actually bring um, specific knowledge to this, but but also more generally, I think, given that the curriculum director really has the responsibility of setting um, the tone for the overall academic program within the schools, I think it it, it also is is um, valuable to have uh, the perspective of someone who's not who's sort of outside the school, but by virtue of having their children in the school, is very much invested in it. Um, but would have, in the end, a different, as you say, not a direct working relationship. All these folks would have a more or less direct working relationship mm -hmm. with that person. So that, um, in this case, it, it, we may be past the point where it is reasonable um, if, if it's favorable, even if it's re it, it may not be reasonable to add someone at this point, but I, I, I think that there is value to including um, parents in the, the interview committees for people of this um, of this importance and given the role of the school councils and other organizations of parents who are involved in supporting the schools, I, I'm willing to bet that there's some talented people there who might, uh, as these folks, good folks have, um, agree to serve and serve the community well in that role. Mm -hmm. And we certainly can take that under consideration. I am also recalling that when I was um, interviewed for uh, the position of director of curriculum, it was uh, only um, teachers and administrators. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do want to say that the uh, director of curriculum works uh, in close collaboration with our building administrators and our teachers uh, throughout the district. But um, certainly a, a great idea, and we can take that under advisement. I just wanted to thank you, Nancy, for this. I know this is going to be a very difficult process for you. It is. So yes. thank you for you know putting this together, and uh, I'm glad that all of our grades are represented. Yes. So. Yeah. Good luck you. with it. Thank you. We're, we, uh, you know, we certainly um, uh, still grieve the loss of our um, former director. We're moving on uh, with our process now. Um, okay, so then my next report is about the um, Massachusetts School Building Authority uh, meeting that we attended. That was uh, uh, Mayor Cadger was there and Deb Luznia and um, uh, Melissa Zawadzki, uh, our city finance director, uh, Dale Doran, our director of business services, and I were members of the selection panel. It was um, uh, two, last Tuesday. Oh, time, I can't believe it. Quickly, <laughs> time oh, flies. Dave, Dave too. What's that? Dave oh, and Dave Boyle, one of our um, school building committee members and a, a community and, and business member. And so um, 
uh, I, as I believe I reported to you before, the first meeting with the School Building Committee, which was um, the MSBA, was uh, two weeks prior to that. We um, took the 11 applications that we had and we sat with their um, selection panel, which is a member of 15 uh, people, architects, uh, engineers, uh, construction uh, managers, and uh, MSBA um, uh, officers. And we sat with them and looked through the 11 applications. We, as our own little selection committee here uh, in the district, which was composed of the mayor, um, of the city finance director, Dale Doran, David Boyle, Deb Lucy, and myself, had um, kind of looked through them, uh, not kind of, but <laughs> looked through them very carefully, but we had uh, kind of come to a consensus on who we were most interested in among the 11 applicants. However, we had to go in front of the, or become actually, three of the, I think that time there were uh, 11, 12 others, so three of, of 15 members on the panel and um, uh, express our, our thoughts about it uh, as each um, a proposal was discussed and uh, also ask questions and then we had to vote and so as we voted and um, each panel member that was each of the 15 panel members gave three points to the um, firm that they believed they liked the best felt was the best match two points to the second and one point to the last and so in that process we narrowed the um, um, the, the 11 applicants down to three and uh, at the last school committee meeting, I wasn't sure I was able to tell you who they were, but um, <laughs> now you, um, I, I am able to. They were Kayla and Beanick, the um, firm that uh, built our high school, designed our high school, rather. And our complex. And our complex, our safety complex. Um, Doran Whittier, uh, a larger firm um, from the eastern part of the state who's done a number of school building projects. And Dale Doran, our Director of Business Services, had had experience with that firm, very positive experience. And Lamarow and Pagano, um, who also have done a number of uh, very interesting school projects. So uh, last Tuesday we went and uh, each of those three fir firms had an opportunity to interview. Um, they did a 30-minute uh, presentation, and at the end of the presentation, we were able to ask our questions, and uh, then they all came back into the room, and um, at that point in time, we were asked to take a vote, uh, all members, on who we wanted uh, to get three points, who for two points, and who for one point. So we really didn't know, um, and, and I had made it clear to uh, to Melissa Zawadzki and to Dale Doran that we each should vote who we believed were, uh, uh, you know, should mm -hmm. get the appropriate points. So when the points were all totaled, um, there were 28 points for Kalo and Beanick and 22 points for each of the other two firms. So it was very close and I think that everybody in the room felt that any of the three firms could have done a wonderful job for us. Mm -hmm. But the uh, fact that Kalo and Beanick were uh, um, local people, they live in our community, um, the, uh, the principal, Curtis Edgen, and, um, and his next in command, Bert and Gardner. Gardner. Both live in our community. Curtis has had students who've been in our schools, and Bert currently has um, students in our schools. So that, um, that apparently carried, uh, and, and, I, and, and I was pleased that it did, and that's how I spoke out, that I thought it did, should carry some weight. And, um, and so they listened to what we had to say, and uh, Kayla and Beanick were selected, and we're very excited, very excited to uh, have them on board and to begin working with mm -hmm. them on uh, schematic designs for a future building project. They showed us a, a few designs that day, and that was pretty exciting to look at, but now they'll really get down to um, uh, official designs. And um, Karen or Deb, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Well, I think it was interesting with the process, as Nancy was saying, it was two weeks to the day, two Tuesday, you know, the um, second Tuesday. And um, what was scored on when they narrowed the 11 down to three, and what their scores were there was how they came in, you know, and were voted on into the three. What happened last Tuesday was the slates clean, so they start fresh. And the vote coming in, I thought they did an excellent job. It was very interesting to see that everybody in the room felt that we were in good hands no matter what. 
and stated that. And these, I thought it was rigorous, very tough. The competition was extremely tough. And, um, and I totally agreed with Nancy when it came down to that, you know, each one of them uh, would do a wonderful job. Uh, we have locally here, you know, two members that live here, mm -hmm. two, you know, two people of the firm that live here, but also we have our proof. We have two buildings that we have worked with them on. So it definitely, you know, in this instant, local matters. It definitely mm -hmm. came down to that. And, um, and uh, <laughs> it makes me smile. I know Nancy will laugh too. Uh, with, as far as the Mass School Building Committee, um, they have no problem speaking up. And if there is anything that is not up to par, they are on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it was um, very tense. Very tense. And, it, and I might add, I, I forgot to mention that the vote is public. The transparency yeah. is incredibly uh, stringent. Uh, we were not allowed to leave the room. The three of uh -huh. us were not allowed to talk to each other. And as soon as the last interview occurred, uh -huh. as I said, we each voted. We did it on two sheets. We did it on one sheet passed that in, recorded it on our second sheet, mm -hmm. and then there was a roll call, and we were each asked to say uh, the name of the mm -hmm. um, group and, and how many points we had given to them. So everybody went around the table and did that, and all of the firms were in the room while we did that. So everybody knew right. exactly what it And there happened. were there 10 members of MSBA that day, and then three? I think, I think there. I think it was, I think I counted 10 at the table. Yes, I believe and so. The, and then you three. Yeah. So there's no telling how the how the vote's going to come out. No, but we didn't um, know until we added it up. Right. So we were. Of course, we were frantically adding it up after that. There the was a lot of excitement <laughs> to come so. in. Deb, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Nope. I think so. you covered it all. Yeah. <laughs> so stay tuned. We're on to some uh, really exciting times ahead. We're really very very excited. That's great. Um, Yes. Thank you. At, our, at our next meeting, if it would be possible to get a, an update, sort of um, putting the the whole project in context in terms of what the possibility, because there's there's a range of possibilities that have been discussed in the past, and there's a range of preferences, and then there's a range of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So I, I just I think it would be useful for us um, to hear perhaps given where we're at now, mm -hmm. a little bit of the backstory and, and where things will go next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that would be uh, very timely to do it at this point now that mm -hmm. we've um, now decided that we have a designer. <laughs> designer, exactly. Um, any other questions or comments on that? Okay. And then the uh, only other update that I had, I just thought that you'd all find it interesting. Um, we opened uh, 43 uh, choice seats in our district this year. And at this point, we only have five left. Mm -hmm. And we also have a number of families who are on wait lists for uh, grades uh, where we uh, weren't able to take in uh, any other students, or we had taken in a couple earlier and then um, didn't have space to take more in. But they wanted to be on the wait lists in case something opened up um, during the year. So we're feeling very pleased about that. Where are the, where are the five seats that are still open? Uh, there are three at the high school and two at the middle school. Well, and our two bigger ask buildings. That one, Peter. <laughs> there are two bigger buildings. And uh, oftentimes, by the time school starts, those seats mm -hmm. are filled as well. But I will keep you updated. Thank you. Okay, moving on. We have um, school choice opening requests. We have one for Maple School Grade 2, one slot request to open for 2016-2017. Correct, and this is a student at Maple whose family is moving to Northampton over the summer and wishes to remain at Maple School. Correct. So approval of this request, ac according to the principal, Judy Averill, would not change current class sizes. It would simply allow a student who's currently in the school system to remain in the system that they prefer to be in. Good to know. I'll make the motion. Second. All those in favor? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Okay, we have some minutes um, to approve. Yep. May 19th, 2016. So I think we actually need to approve the May 10th minutes. There was some discussion. Right. And do you have them? I do. Okay. Um, 
So I, I would move that we approve. The, you'll recall this is the one that, well, at least in part, this brought up the question of whether people who were actually at the, that meeting could vote. And they can. <laughs> um, they can also choose to abstain still. But uh, so um, this, the first item that we would need would be a motion to approve the minutes of the May 10th, 2016 meeting. He was third on the list, but that's okay. If you want to do it first, that's okay. <laughs> we'll let you. It's fine. Okay. So Sorry, it was first in the pile. <laughs> I have, um, I have <laughs> one thing I noticed about those May 10th meetings, and that is the name of the parent that came and spoke with us, Michelle Gagnon. Her name is not spelled correctly in the minutes under the public speech gotcha. paragraph. What is the correct spelling? Okay. Uh, G A G E O G H A N or something. That's. I'd have to look it up. I honestly. I can find that for you, Sue. Okay. So. But it's it's very different than what's here. So I thought we should be sure to have that recorded properly. All right. It's pronounced. It sounds the same, but it's spelled very differently. Right. Okay. So would we want to approve that with that change? Yeah. Is there a motion? Yeah. Uh, sure. Second. <laughs> Okay, all those in favor of approving the May 10th, 2016 school committee meetings with the change minutes noted. With the change noted? Yes. I right. abstain right, again. Thanks. Okay, motion passes. One abstention. So then. You pick which one you want to do. No, no, no. I'm going to do this <laughs> now. Because this is great. Because the, these. So that, I, just, I just signed the like executive session. I just signed that. It needs to be voted on as well. It's not. So here, how's okay. that? We'll do All one right. that's not even on the list. <laughs> okay. Here's the motion for the minutes for the executive session from June 20th um, for discussion of uh, superintendent evaluation and contract negotiation. Second. All those in favor? Motion passes, one abstention. Okay. Hang on, Moving I'm on. getting there. <laughs> I'm trying to keep things. All right, so now, where's May 19th? I have a copy right here. Hang on, I'm sure it's here. Yeah, look. Okay. It has a work session. Motion? <laughs> gotcha. Motion to uh, approve the work session minutes from May 19th, 2016. Uh, second. All those in favor? <laughs> so we have, we have three approvals and two abstentions. So motion does not pass. We need to right. postpone that another week. Right. So three. Peter can keep track of it. Zero. Two. Even though you're not present at the meeting, you can still approve the minutes. Okay. Should we try it again? <laughs> okay, motion to approve the work session minutes. I'm glad this is on tape. Work session minutes for the East Hampton School Committee meeting on May 19th, 2016. Second. Second. All those in favor? <laughs> okay. Good job, everybody. Yeah. Okay. We really Four. Worked, worked that one out. Got it. Thank you. Woo. Four in favor, one abstention. Motion passes. Okay. Okay, so Thank now. You. June? June 14th, 14th. regular session. I got it. <laughs> I got them now. Ow. Oh, yeah. That meeting. <laughs> Motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting of June 14th, 2016. Second. All those in favor? Motion passes. Okay. Warrants and payroll. Hang on. We'll, so we'll check that I've got that all done right. I think we're there. Okay. I the pen sheets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been a while since I've read these. Uh, motion to approve the school payroll dated 23 June 2016 in the amount of $905,575.99. Second. Yes, 905,000, it's a large number. $905,575.99. Second. 
Is there a second? Yes, second. All those in favor? Just, just an, yeah, I know. You got away with that. That was Sorry. nice. <laughs> to just a note for people, because that is an unusually large number, but that's because the payroll for staff is paid for the, over the summer at the end of June. Mm -hmm. So even so though they're, all of them. They're, it, that's why the number jumps, and then it goes down dramatically in July and August. So, okay. I just remember when I came in and looked at it to sign, I was like, wow, and then I remember. Okay. Motion to approve accounts payable authorization for payment dated 23 June 2016 in the amount of $728,422.80. Second. Oh, there's a motion to approve and it's been seconded <laughs> to uh, approve the accounts payable authorization for payment dated June 23, 2016 in the amount of $728,422.80. 70 cents. 80 cents. Shoot. Um, does it matter that the warrant that we s that was signed is off by t ten, ten cents? cents? I think we should vote the one that we've signed because that's, that's the one that we read. The one that you signed is the one that we should. Read. Yeah. So this okay. make this should be, 70 cents? should be seventy cents somewhere out there. Some account is spinning in there. Okay, I'll repeat. There's been a motion and it's been <laughs> seconded to approve the accounts payable authorization for payment dated June twenty third, two thousand sixteen, in the amount of. Seven hundred and twenty-eight thousand four hundred twenty-two dollars and seventy cents. All those in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. And we do need a signature still on the payroll authorization again, so that people know that the that these are are read and reviewed in advance by members. multiple members of the school committee mm -hmm. in advance of the meeting before we're taking a vote. So. There we go. So that's it. That's it. We're just yeah. signing. Right. So okay. a motion. Motion. Is it? So, okay so we need to have some signatures, and then we motion could entertain adjourn. a motion to adjourn. Yes. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Can I sign that? Do you need? Do you need extra?